services right up here in front uh, just to uh, get some things together so um, yeah we'll go on from there um, the elders deacons preachers meeting that was scheduled for today has been rescheduled for the uh, February 21st at 4 o'clock please remember that and um, the uh, cards this week that we're sending out uh, to uh, Diane Moore and Bill and Mary Lou um, they uh, they're not sick, they're just kind of apprehensive about coming out uh, and getting um, the uh, virus. So uh, it would be good to have a card of encouragement to them and, uh, and to uh, send them some encouragement. Uh, the 2021 calendars are available. If you didn't get one yet, please do so. Our new website is now available, thanks to Dave. And uh, there's a uh, little article in there about uh, how to get a hold of that online. That might be it. I got one of my pitch bike. It's in my foot pocket. Give me a minute. <laughs> Everything's going on. Make sure you get a bulletin. And, uh, thank you for that. Did you Thank you. <laughs> um, Brother Willie is uh, scheduled for surgery on the uh, 15th uh, to remove the uh, benign tumor that is, uh, is his third eye. Here. So, uh, ask for prayers on his behalf. There's a lot of doctor's appointments and things between now and then. So, again, the surgery is scheduled for the 15th. So, I think that's about all I've got. There are other things in the bulletin. Please look them over. Barb does a wonderful job when it comes to this bulletin. I've seen others that Amen. aren't here as good as this one. So. Okay, our numbers are low, but we can still worship. So let's do that. Let's say this together. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I sing praises to your name. Teach me in your truth and teach me 
For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. <coughs> I'm with thee, O oh Lord. Oh, 
you want to throw the hammer through the wall. But at the same aspect, the pain that Christ went through, we will never know. The pain that Christ went through on the cross was horrific. And in the end, Christ had his reward. His reward could be in heaven. The loved ones we have lost this week, we can take hope and prayer in the solace that they're in heaven. With those thoughts in our mind, I'm going to ask prayer for the bread that represents Christ's body that was broken on the cross. Our dear and gracious God, we thank you for sending your only son to die on that cross. As we partake of this bread that represents his body that was broken on the cross, let us reflect upon that to give us the strength and the courage to keep fighting the good fight for you. For it's your son's name we humbly pray. Amen. Thank you, God, for your son that sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice on that cross. This fruit of the vine that represents his blood that cleanses us. We thank you for giving us that ultimate sacrifice and we can have the hope and promise of eternal life with you one day in heaven. Your son's name, we only pray. Amen. Yeah. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We have another act that we are told and commanded to give portion of what we've been blessed with, living on this earth, the benefits we have, the blessings we have, it truly is great to call ourselves Christian. We are commanded to give a portion of that as what we have been blessed with back to the Lord to help them further the work here and throughout the world. You please bow your heads and pray with me. Our dear and gracious God, we thank you for giving us all the blessings we have, all the wonders that we have in our lives. Bless the gift and bless the giver. Give with a cheerful heart, not a begrudging heart. For your son's name, we only pray. Amen. <laughs>
Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of mine. Let me more of beauty see, wonderful words of mine. Words of life and beauty, each be great and dirty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of mine. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of mine. Christ so blessed is my gifts to all. Wonderful words of mine, sinner, listen to the loving call. Wonderful words of mine, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of mine. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of mine. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Don't conserve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Please be seated. Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you out this morning. I'm glad you've made the decision to join us. I'd like to offer my condolences and my sympathies to, to Butch and Jake and all of the rest of the McNutt family, and frankly, to all of the congregation here for the loss of a, a dear loved one. We will miss Val for sure. This morning, we will be wrapping up John chapter 6. We're, we're done, I promise. I promise you, Mike, we're done with it. Today is the last one for John chapter 6. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open up to John chapter 6. I will be working through verses 60 through 71 today. Now, as I was looking over the passage this week, getting the lesson prepared, I couldn't help but think to myself that this passage would make a great soap opera. It would make a great soap opera. There is so much going on, and if, if you are one of those people who likes soap operas, it's okay, but I will ask you to come forward at the end of the service. But we'll see in our text that there is continued grumbling, there is conflict, there is this big reveal of truth, it's life-changing truth. There's scandal, there is renewed and refreshed commitment, there's betrayal. You see why it says it's, it's a soap opera? There's so much here. I'd like for us also to remember where we've been. We've been in John chapter 6 a while. We've covered a lot of stuff. But over the course of this whole discourse in John chapter 6, Jesus has been trying to persuade these people to focus on the eternal and to let go of the temple. A reprioritization of life where the eternal is kept in mind above the temple. He's been trying to get the people to come to a point of belief in him 
as the Savior that they need through this message that he's been proclaiming. He has revealed eternal life to be exclusively gained solely and only through him. There is no other option of gaining eternal life through any other means. And all of this, everything that Jesus has said thus far has been validated through the sign that he had performed just the day before. Remember, this is just all within a one day span where he fed the 5,000 loaves and fishes. You recall too, at the end of the book of John, he says that signs were for the purpose of bringing about belief in Jesus as the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. That was the whole point of every single sign that Jesus did was to bring about this belief. And yet we'll find out as we conclude this chapter that the people did not believe. They were left in their unbelief despite the sign that was given. And instead of wanting to force Jesus to become their king, they end up abandoning him, as we'll see in verse 66. Now all of this, this, this abandonment, was due in part to the, the message, but also with the way that the message was given across, this harsh language as we discussed last week. You remember things Jesus said like he came down from heaven? That would have been offensive to their ears. <coughs> And that everyone who wants to gain eternal life must eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's some pretty offensive stuff to, to our ears. If we didn't know what else was going to happen, that would be offensive to us as well. And it's just after all of this transpires that we see the conclusion of this interaction between Jesus and the crowd. That's where we find ourselves this morning. I'd like to ask you, though, how do you think you would respond to all of this information? If you were back, back in the first century, you didn't have the New Testament, you didn't know that Jesus was going to die on the cross, you didn't know any of that, and you're hearing all of this for the very first time, I, I believe I would have a hard time stomaching everything that Jesus has just said. You have to cut them a little bit of slack, just a little bit. They said, let, well, let's read in verses 61, or I'm sorry, 60 through 62, and then we'll get into this. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The text tells us how the crowd felt about it. We might be able to identify with this crowd. They responded with the usual grumbling. And taking offense to this truth that Jesus has just proclaimed. They said this is a hard saying. It was harsh on their ears. It was difficult to receive. And yet, rather than wrestling with the information, asking for further clarification, trying to understand what Jesus was trying to say, they just dismissed it. Who can listen to this? We're all too like that. In a lot of ways, when we don't like truth, we want to dismiss it rather than wrestle with it. And so Jesus, in response to their unbelief, asked them a couple of really great questions. We'll pick on those in a little bit more detail right now. He says, do you take offense at this? Do you take offense at this? Now this is interesting. Here's our brief Greek lesson for today. The word offense comes from the word scandalizo. Scandalizo, scandalous, scandal. It's the same word that is, is used in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, where Jesus is talking about the lustful eye. If your eye causes you to lust, it causes you to stumble. If it causes you to stumble, what are you to do with it? You're to pluck it out and throw it away. It's the same kind of meaning that we see here. The thing that is causing you to stumble in sin. So Jesus is saying, all right, everything I've said to you thus far, if that's causing you to stumble in sin, what about this? And what does he say? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? That would have really tripped them up. That's because the Jews would have immediately picked up on what Jesus was saying. We've talked about this briefly in, in the last couple of weeks. But this statement would have brought to their minds Daniel chapter 7, 
verses 13 and 14. I'd like to read that very quickly. They would have thought of this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Amen. That's the kingdom we're hoping for. This is the illusion that Jesus is making to these people. He's saying, guys, I am this guy. I am the son of man. If all these things I've said before are going to trip you up so badly, what about seeing me coronated on my throne and having an everlasting dominion over all things? You think that would have tripped them up? Perhaps. They would have recognized what Jesus was saying. We'll see this very event take place in Acts chapter 1. If you look in your Bibles, this is where it all takes place, where he ascends back to heaven and is seated on his throne. Do you think this would have settled the dispute and ended their grumbling? Perhaps not. I don't think it did. But I can only imagine just how stunned they would have been hearing this information, hearing this claim. And as stunned as they were, what Jesus does is he simply goes back to repeating the same message that he's been giving them all along in verses 63 through 65. Now I'd like to read through that with you together. And you'll notice as we read through that there's a, a parenthetical statement that's in there. It's a commentary from the author John. And so I'd, I'd like to read through it without the commentary and then go back through and talk about the commentary. So just bear with me there. Jesus, going back to his message, says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Verse 65, And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. I'd like to, I'd like to say this, that this information is information that Jesus has already given us. Before we get tripped up on what he has said, that nobody can come to the Father unless it is granted on him, he has already spoken about this. We've already broken this down. So I'd, I'd like to break down what Jesus has said into a couple of parts here. Let's look at what he says. It is the Spirit who gives life. And it's not the flesh. It's not the flesh. The flesh does not contribute to us gaining life. If our flesh could contribute to us gaining life, then Jesus' death is not a necessity. If we could do it on our own, apart from Jesus and apart from the Spirit, then everything that Jesus went through, his cruel death on the cross, was pointless. It was unnecessary. The Spirit gives life, and the flesh is no help at all. Jesus also says that it is the words that he has spoken that are spirit and life. That is to say that life is derived from the very words of God. What he has said is where we find our life, when we encapsulate it, we take it in, we absorb it, and we live it out. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's look at this, this next thing. Look at the very first word that is said in verse 64. But, it might, your translation might say something differently, but there is a contrast that is being made. Contrast being made between those who don't believe and those who do believe. Believe and those who don't believe are not gaining life from Jesus' words. And those who don't believe are also those who are still relying on the flesh, at least in part, instead of the Spirit. And Jesus concludes his thoughts in verse 65, I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So I said that Jesus has already given us this information. He is reiterating himself as he closes out this conversation with the crowd. How one comes to the Father has already been explained to us in verses 44 and 45. So let's go ahead and read those again just to refresh our memories. 
Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father does what? Comes to me. Anyone who has heard and learned from the Father, anyone who has been taught by God, comes to me. This is why personal evangelism cannot be excluded. Why it is so important that personal evangelism takes place. And it's, it's important because people must be taught of God if they're ever going to be drawn by God. Those who never hear of Jesus, we can't expect them to be drawn to him. But if they're taught of him, they can be. This is also why it's so important that we know the gospel in and out, that we're able to present it to people, that they can learn and be drawn. Now I'd like to turn and address this commentary that, that John throws in there in verse 64. <laughs> in your parentheses, you'll see something that says, For Jesus knew from the beginning those who... <coughs> those... <coughs> From the beginning, who those were who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. He already knew. He has divine foreknowledge. He already knows the end from the beginning. And yet what's so amazing is knowing this, knowing that he would be betrayed, and knowing how he would be betrayed, he continues in his ministry. How difficult do you think that might have been, knowing what lies ahead? Knowing how things are going to end for you, at least this side of the cross, how difficult it would have been to continue. And then we also see that our narrative starts to take a turn from general unbelievers and general unbelief to a specific individual. And the rest of this thought picks up really at the end of the chapter in verses 70 through 71. And Jesus answered them, I did, not, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve. And he was going to betray him. Now what's interesting is that Jesus ends his statement with saying one of you is a devil, and that's the end of it. There's no further conversation about it. The, the chapter just stops. I, I find that interesting. It's a little bit of a cliffhanger if you ask me. But after all of this, all that Jesus has said, all that Jesus has done, it leads to what I consider to be a terribly tragic, tragic scene. A terribly sad moment. Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Doesn't that break your heart? It should. People have made the decision to reject their Savior and reject the offer of eternal life that is within arm's reach. Many of them turn back and no longer walk with Him. We have just seen this great division take place. We are separating the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. This great division has taken place between the superficial disciples who just wanted to get something from Jesus and those who were committed. Jesus 12. The truth. Truth has this kind of effect, doesn't it? The truth is presented, it causes division. There is no way around it. Truth causes division between those who will adhere to it and incorporate it into their lives and those who will reject it. There is no middle ground on truth. Something is or it is not. Are you going to believe it or are you not? And this is what Jesus has done with his truth. It divides men. It divides men or men change it to suit themselves. That's the nature of truth. We see that a lot in our culture today, don't we? It's a hard time discerning what is truth in this world anymore. Thankfully, we have it. 
We have the truth that we need. What sometimes happens instead of walking away from Jesus, or at least we like to think it's not walking away from Jesus, is we create a Jesus that doesn't offend anybody. His truth doesn't offend anybody. He doesn't step on any toes. We create and believe in a Jesus that doesn't require us as his followers to pick up a cross and die daily. That's the Jesus that we have committed to following, those of us who are Christians in this room. We believe in a Jesus that only requires us to do things that we agree with and that we like. Not the one that expects us to work hard and lay down our lives for the benefit of others. We don't like that. The crowd wasn't given that option in our text. They weren't given that option to, to come up with some kind of phony Jesus that they liked. They had to make that decision then and there. And they made theirs when they walked away. After this, Jesus then turns and offers this very same decision, the same choice to his chosen 12 in verse 67. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Do you want to go away as well? Are you committed to me or not? That's another way of saying it. How do you think Jesus felt at this moment? Seeing the multitudes walk away, knowing what was ahead for them, remaining in their unbelief. We can only really speculate, but we can speculate based upon our own human experience. Remember, Jesus was human as well. Perhaps he was angry or frustrated. Perhaps he was heartbroken and sad. Had pity on the crowd because they didn't know what they were walking away from. We can only speculate. And as sad as it is that they walked away, look at this incredible, hope-filled statement in the following two verses, verses 68 and 69. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen. Oh, oh that we would be like Peter. Oh, that we would come to this realization, the same one that he has, that we would come to the same kind of belief that he has every day of our lives. When we face trouble and adversity in our life, that we, we would stop and say, where else am I going to go but Jesus? He has the words of life. He has what I need to get me through. That we would be like Peter. This is the statement of a sold-out believer. Somebody who is all in. Now we know that he denied him later on. But at least in this moment, he knew what he needed to do. No, he was on the right path. This is someone who has realized that there is nowhere else to go and no one else to go to but Jesus. There is no doctor. There is no lawyer. There is no investment banker. There is no counselor and there is no politician on this earth that can give us the eternal life that we need. Amen. <laughs> we can thank God for that. Only Jesus can give us that life. The problem that we'll see as we continue in this chapter and the chapters to come is that not all of Jesus' disciples were like Peter. Not like Peter sometimes, myself included. We come to find out that Judas will go on to betray the one who gives eternal life. Our text calls him a devil. The Greek word is diabolos. It means an enemy, an adversary, a slanderer. Remember, he was also one of the chosen twelve. Jesus handpicked him for this. Remember, he also walked with Jesus daily. But his proximity to Jesus didn't help his unbelief. He still didn't believe. Now this word betrayal is the same word that is used when Jesus gives up his spirit on the cross. 
We remember that Jesus is breathing his last moments, and it says that he gave up his spirit. Gave up. What we're looking at here when it says that Judas would betray him is we're talking about a willing sacrifice. Willing sacrifice. Give him up willingly. Now before we look down on Judas too much, we have to do a little bit of soul searching. And I hope we all have our steel toed boots on. As I step on my toes, we might step on some of yours. Still love you. Hope you love me back. But before we look down at Jesus, Judas too much, we have to do some soul searching. What are some things that we sacrifice Jesus for in our own lives? We all do it. Could it be for convenience? You know, I've, I've said it before how much I have really loved online services when the COVID was really bad. And we should, we should appreciate them. They're an excellent tool. They are great for when things are bad and we want to be safe. But when they become the replacement for fellowship with each other and fellowship with our Lord, that's a problem. We need to be safe and take our precautions, but we cannot let it slip into the realm of convenience for convenience's sake. To go with that comfort, do we sacrifice our time with our Lord for the sake of comfort? There are times when I'd just rather lay in bed all day or lay on the couch all day rather than spend some time in prayer, reading my Bible, coming to, to fellowship with my fellow saints. Perhaps you can identify with that too. Perhaps we sacrifice Jesus for the sake of avoiding conflict. Well, the truth of the matter, church, is, is if you're a Christian, and you are a faithful Christian, you're going to encounter some conflict with the world. There's no if, ifs, or buts about it. The world is hostile towards Christ, and if you are with Christ, they're going to be hostile towards you. Perhaps we sacrifice Jesus for the sake of avoiding that conflict. To go with that, that can translate into appeasing friends and family and co-workers who are hostile towards God and His gospel. We don't want to deal with that. I'd like to remind us also that none of these things, convenience, comfort, avoiding conflict, our friends, our family, our co-workers, none of those things can give us the eternal life that only Jesus can. So to whom will you be loyal? I pray that we can be more like Peter. We make that great realization and we cling to it every single day. Maybe you're realizing today, like Peter did, that Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. If there's anybody who's not a Christian in this room already, I don't think that applies to anybody today, but I hope you come to that realization. If you are a Christian already, I hope you cling to that realization as well. I'd like to help you become a Christian if you're not. If you're viewing online, that applies to you as well. We want to help you in any way we can. Maybe you're already a Christian, but you view yourself kind of like a Judas right now. We've all been there. We want to help. Perhaps you're saying that your priorities aren't straight. You've been putting other things ahead of your relationship with your Lord. You've been giving up your pursuit for a relationship with Jesus for just other things that life eternity just don't matter. We want to help you get back on track today. Don't leave here today without getting your life in order. We want to help you do that. Let us pray with you. Let's get together and talk sometime. Give me a call. Shoot me an email. We stand ready to serve you. If there's anything you need, don't let your needs go unmet today. Come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs> Oh, dear, the welcome.
Amen. Amen. We've had two come forward this morning. Our sister Ruth Cato and our brother Jake McNutt. I'd like to begin with Ruth. She tells me that she, uh, I think we can ad all identify with this. We just don't feel like we're praying enough or studying enough. Sometimes that leaves us feeling like we're just not enough. How could we be when you stop and think about it? There isn't enough praying or studying that we can do to ever make ourselves good enough. And we can be thankful that God makes us good enough through his son. He makes us good enough through his son. That's a precious, that's the gospel. That is the precious gift that's available to us. We don't have to wrestle with those feelings. We'd like to take a moment to pray for Ruth. And then Jake has a few words that he'd like to say to address the congregation. So let's go ahead and pray for Ruth. Living Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We're thankful for this church family that you have blessed us with, that we could come together and support each other. When we have these moments where we just don't feel adequate, Lord, we lift up our sister Ruth this morning, who is suffering with those feelings this very day. We ask that you would help us to encourage her today and in the days to come, to help her as she battles these kind of feelings, and we all, we all do, Father. God, we are thankful for your son who has laid down his life to give us his righteousness. And we can stand with confidence before you, knowing that you have made us good enough in your sight. You can look at us and tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. We long to hear those words from you, Father. God, I ask that you would help Ruth to have a peace of mind as she works through these things. Help us to study with her when she needs some help and pray with her when she needs prayer. Help us to all be good brothers and sisters to our dear sister and our dear friend Ruth. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would have had Brother David say this, but I want to say this from my heart. I have not been as strong as a Christian as I should have been all these years. I have let many things get in from the world get into my life. I have I have been battling a tobacco issue for going on for twenty seven over twenty five years. I thought I could beat it on my own. I cannot. I have tried. I have said things to my family that has hurt my family. But they thought about passing away. I want to make sure my life is right with God when that time comes for me. And I just wanted to let the congregation know those are the issues that I have been dealing with. Being a Christian is never easy, but with the love of this congregation that I am now proud to say that I am a part of, that's a lot of love. I wanted to let everybody know that that's the issue that I have been dealing with. Sorry, I'm a bit of a ball baby. <laughs> I guess it's a freaking ball inheritance, I guess. <laughs> but those are the issues that I have had. I have tried to quit, and it has not worked successfully. I'm just asking for the prayer of the congregation.
have a prayer for our brother Jake. Jake, we thank you for your, your humility to come up and speak. It takes a lot. Father, we thank you once again for all the blessings that we have in this life. What a blessing it is to have Jake among our number, to be our brother and our friend. Lord, we're thankful for his humility and willingness to come up here and speak from his heart. I know that he's feeling rather raw this morning with everything that's transpired in this last week. God, we lift him up in prayer this morning because we know just how strong the vices of this world can be. We ask that you help us to be an encouragement to him and be a, a person to talk to when he's struggling with those things. We're thankful that he has this repentant heart that he wants to get away from these things. Help us to encourage him as he travels down this path. God, help us also to love and encourage him after the loss of Ann Malcolm. We know how much he loves her. We all love her, Father. God, help us to encourage all of us. We're all battling various things in our lives. Things we know about, things we don't. We know how hard it can be, and it is through your love and the love that we share between us that we can overcome so much of this in this life. We know that you've paid the price to to make it despite ourselves. Help us to have the courage to continue on and continue striving to become more perfect, like your son, to become more sanctified every day. Help us in our weakness, Father. Please forgive us of our sins. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> people in this congregation today who have fought the same battle. So I hope that you you know who you are. Don't take out. And uh, I, I certainly do appreciate it being here. <laughs> You've been doing a lot. And uh, we just uh, you know, we, we kind of clicked away even more than we did when they were here before. So uh, it, it's, a, it's really a good thing. So he, He's grown from there. He's growing from here. And with our help, our God's help, the great Hosanna. Mm -hmm. Ladies, don't forget, meet up over here. Um, we'll uh, talk about what we can do for uh, the funeral coming up. Would you please stand? Please sing out. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come to worship you this morning. We ask, Lord, that you wrap your loving arms around the McNuck family, around Ruth. Help us to be an encouragement to them, as well as a blessing. We thank you so much for your son who gives us that hope, for his teachings that have lasted throughout the span of time. As we leave here this morning, this morning, Father, allow us to take you with us. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Hold us in your loving hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.